Uh, molecules versus atoms, what's the difference? Um, the molecule is when you have two more elements. The smallest unit of two or more elements, and an atom is when you have two or more elements. Okay. That's good. Smallest unit. How do you know it's the smallest unit? Subatomic particles. And how, how did they figure that out? Uh, how did they figure out that it can't be broken up into smaller and smaller atoms, let's say? Uh-huh. Yeah, well, a collider. It doesn't have to be the Haldron Collider. Haldron Collider is the one that's getting a lot of press right now. There's a lot of stuff coming out of there. Good. Good. Uh, anything else? What were some of the other key points that were discussed? Uh huh. States of matter. The states of matter. Yeah. What were the uh, states? Solid, liquid, gas, and then there was one more state. Plasma. Uh huh. Um, I have a question about the states of matter. Is ferrofluid its own state of matter as well? Does that fall into the liquid? Well, you know, there's other like, like super, or super critical fluids. Those, yeah, those would be additional states. You know. A ferrofluid, I'm not that familiar with. Um, what is it, like a magnetic? Yeah, there are things that are, um, <clears throat> that are like in between states. And there are things that are kind of their own states. Like supercritical fluids are in between the liquid and the gas. But it's, it's neither, it's, it's, it's just a... It's like a substate? Yeah. Just a state that not everything forms a supercritical fluid, but there are a number of things that do. And then there are other ones that are borderline, you know, um, between that state. And so um, we'll, we'll, we'll see more of these as we go along. Okay, was there anything else discussed yesterday? Anything else you want to work? The smallest atom. What was the smallest atom? Helium. Helium. About how big was it? Or is it? I shouldn't say. Hmm? About how many? Just give me a rough estimate. Order of magnitude. 100? Or what is it? Ferrometers? No. 1 times 10 to the minus 10 picometers? About 100 picometers. 100 picometers or about one angstrom on the small end. And on the big end, it would be like what? The biggest. On the big end, it would be like what? Well, just, you know, ballpark. It doesn't have to be exact. The reason we need some numbers, um, <clears throat> because uh, when, you, when you start uh, talking with scientists, you know, oh, that's really small. Well, you know, how small is that? You know, they'll want to know, how, is that like a millimeter small? A micrometer small? You know, how small is it? Uh, and if you can't, you know, it's nice to have some kind of ballpark, you know, oh, those are really big, they're really big trees, you know, up in the forest. Well, somebody, somebody was going to want to know how big the trees are, you know, like 50 feet? Under feet? Well, I don't know. They're just really big. Just like atoms are really, really small, but I don't know how small. I just know that they're really, really small. And so we need some reference points. Um, and it's, it's not that you have to memorize a lot of information, but we want to memorize a little bit of information. That, that way we have some kind of bearing point, you know, um, some sort of reference point. And so these numbers, they might seem, you know, it seems useless because, you know, you could. Google the information, or you can find it online, or do whatever. But there are certain things that you should have, you know, um, memorized. You know, uh, <clears throat> just for uh, basic knowledge. Okay, what else? Was there anything else that was that you thought was maybe important? Uh huh. The kinetic <clears throat> yeah, kinetic molecular theory. Tell me a little bit about kinetic molecular theory. It's motion, right? Kinetic means motion. And the hotter something is, the faster it moves. Yeah, right. And um, 
the colder it is, the slower it moves, right? And then what else? Well, okay, resonance frequency is not that, not yet. Resonance frequency is going to be later on. And so resonance frequency, did you guys, did that make sense what resonance frequency is? Yeah. That's why microwaves are so efficient. Microwaves are going to hit that right movement. You know, it, it costs a certain amount of energy to move like this or like this, you know. It costs a different amount of energy to move. And so if you're going to move like this, well, do you want to hit it with all energy or just the right amount of energy? If you hit it just with the right amount of energy, that's the resonant you know, frequency. Frequency is related to the energy. Of the, uh, we'll talk about that later. But, um, but what, tell me more about temperature and motion. Uh -huh. Isn't it when it's at absolute zero, is when it stops moving? Right. At absolute zero, everything stops moving. Now, how cold is absolute zero? Negative 273 Celsius, okay. or about, um, we'll see other ways of representing it as well. Yeah. Well, the atoms stop moving, and uh, we don't get, what, what were the types of motion? <clears throat> yeah, vibrational motion. That's why I showed the video about vibrational modes. Things just don't vibrate, you know, in some random pattern. There's certain patterns that are observed in nature when things vibrate. And so, for example, the three atom, well, uh, three atom system. Well, they, they, they had. This is why the the shape of things are so important because if you have three atoms laid out in the line, then she said, oh, there are three degrees of freedom here, and those degrees of freedom are based on the shape and mathematics. You know, you look for mathematics. Water, water looks like a boomerang, you know, and so there are more potential modes there. But, um, so shape is, is going to, in, in fact, that shape, when we look at the energy, and I, you know, the, 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 I'm not sure how accurate that video is because the video is, uh, but it, the conceptually it's, it's accurate, you know, because usually to rotate water molecules, you need microwaves to do a microwave radiation. To vibrate water molecules, that's what we call infrared, and usually infrared radiation, IR radiation is enough for vibrations. So um, normally when I think about those vibrational modes, those are not in the microwave, those are in the infrared. The microwave ovens operate at about 2.45 gigahertz. And so those, so it, it's not 100% accurate, that video, but uh, conceptually it's pretty, pretty okay. Uh-huh. Uh, when a molecule forms, is it a nuclei that bond? That's very tricky. How do the atoms, like in water, how are the atoms held together? Now they showed a stick holding it together, right? But there's no stick there holding it together. What, what's holding it together are electrical attractions. Electrical attractions, <coughs> and because, well you know um, about electrons and you know about the nucleus. Well, the electrons are negatively charged, the nucleus is positively charged. So if you put the electrons between the two nuclei, the electrons are going to be attracted to that negatively charged region. That's, uh, that's, a, that's electro electrical. Uh, that's different. There are um, forces of, of nature. The forces of nature would be like gravitational force, you know, with pull, uh, the apple being pulled down to the, to the ground, the gravitational force. Um, do you know any other forces of nature? Other forces of nature would be electrical force. Electric. Electrical forces are an attraction between positive and negative. If you have positive and negative, they attract each other. If you have positive and positive, they repel each other. Negative, negative, repel each other. Along with electrical forces, we have magnetic forces. You know, north pole of a magnet is attracted to what pole? Is it attracted to the north pole of another magnet or the south pole? South, north and south, right. And so we have electrical, magnetic, but we also have these, um, these what we call nuclear forces or strong forces. These are much stronger than electrical forces. You know. uh, nuclear forces are what's responsible for keeping the nu those different parts of the atom. When you look at the atom, uh, we actually, you know, the atom is just not a ball. We got to look at what an atom is made out of and how it's structured to get a better understanding of how atoms operate. 
the inside, um, this, the, the nuclear forces are the realm of the nuclear chemists and nuclear physicists. The electrical forces are the realm of the chemists, analytical chemists, organic chemists, biochemists, biologists, geologists. All, all those people are really concerned with, you know, as far as chemical properties go, the electrical forces. Uh -huh. If you took a compressed tank of hydrogen gas uh -huh. and oxygen gas, two separate tanks, and I shot them at each other, would it make water? Would, would it make water? Yes. Yeah, like if you shot the gas with water? No. Um, uh, yeah, it, it would form very slowly. If you shot the two gases at each other, room temperature, the reaction is very slow. It's like this. <clears throat> we know methane burns in air, but it burns very slow at room temperature. You know, it's like paper. When you, ha uh, you I don't know if you have any very old papers, but if you have very old papers, you know, they start to discolor. They, they start to look like as if they're starting to burn slowly. They are starting to burn slowly. They're going to turn brown and eventually turn to ash many, many years later, but it's going to be a very slow process. Now, if you shot the hydrogen and oxygen together and <clears throat> there was a heat source, the, they react so fast and so violently, it usually explodes. During that explosion, there's going to be so much energy and heat generated that any water that's formed is vaporized. Eventually, it's, it'll condense into, into, um, and uh, the, the same thing, you know, when we burn methane, you, you know, I don't see droplets of water form when we burn methane. This is what we're doing on Thursday, by the way. So I'll just demo the first part of the experiment. We have Bunsen burner here. Uh, it's, uh, this technically, this is a fancier version of the Bunsen burner because uh, we can adjust the, the flame. And so if you see any water coming off this, this is a plasma, by the way, a plasma of course, it doesn't matter. It doesn't live long because it's unstable. The cosmos are not the least unstable. But what we can do is we can capture the water, like here, you know. And so this is a lot cooler, so when the water hits, the water vapor hits this, um, you know, you can, do you see the moisture uh, condensing on the surface? So that's the water there. We can trap it. If I put ice around this, I'll get a lot more. Back, I'll start seeing drips of water coming, coming down off this. And so the same thing would happen, you know, there'd be so much energy, it'd be vaporized anyway. Right? So you'd, you'd be very, you'd have to be very careful with that. Okay, what else about uh, kinetic molecular theory so, uh, that you have in your notes? Uh huh. What was the third type of well, um, motion? Yeah, we had vibrational. Uh -huh. so what were, what were the, uh, what was the second? Did somebody mention the second? Rotational, and then the third? Hmm? I'm sorry? Resonant? Now, resonant is not a type of motion. Resonant is just when things resonate with each other. They kind of match. Like, say, if you have um, a group um, that they're singing together, if one person's off, you know, then they aren't resonating with the rest of the group kind of thing. That's resonating is when you you got the right The, nobody wrote down the third? You see, the, the thing about studying, you know, um, is this. One, you you got to have it down. If you don't have it down in your notes, you know, then you're never going to have it. You know, because what happens is the information is lost rapidly. And so th this is the reason I wrote things down right after class, because maybe I didn't have enough time to write it down, but I remembered it, you know. But the problem with memory is, by the next day, you know, they say you're going to forget at least 60% of what you remembered from the day, you know. It's like, it's a race with time, you know, and so each hour you lose more memory. And then by the next day, you, you've lost quite a lot. And so it's really critical. If you don't have it written down, then what are you going to study for the final? You know, what are you going to study for the midterm? It's gone, you know. If it's gone and you get hit with a question like that, you know, then, and so uh, the important thing is just to um, write things down, and then the next thing is to review it, because if you don't review it, the same thing will happen, you know, the memory will fade, and so, that's it, but, uh, so if nobody wrote down translational, when it comes to studying for the midterm, then um, it's gone, you know, translational was the third one. 
And then there are people that don't write anything, and then they get hit with a question, what were the three modes, uh, three different types of motion? You know? Some people will have it, other people won't, and you get a bimodal distribution. You know? It's not that everything's memorization, but you should have some stuff. Okay, anything else we talked about yesterday? Okay, and so these are the types of um, you know things you should do uh, just to just to stay on top of the material. All right, we're going to continue then. So I talked about this, right? The um, water. Did I talk about this? I didn't talk about this. No. Let's talk about this. So uh, when we visualize like water, let's say in the liquid state, it's, we, we can see it obviously. In the solid state, we can see water as ice cubes. In the gaseous state, it's a little bit more difficult to see. Um, the gaseous state is pretty invisible. Um, that's hard to detect water. Because the gaseous would just be steam, you know. I can capture it like I did with a beaker above there and, and condense it back into liquid, and once it's liquid, then I can see it. The reason I can't see is particles are too small. You know, when the particles get too small, it's hard to see. And the particles and the gases, then you're trying to look at individual gas molecules because they're all spread apart. You know, so it's difficult to see. But uh, if you have droplets of water, it's a lot easier to see because if you have, you know, in, in one drop of water, there are trillions and trillions of water molecules, and you got that, then a lot easier to see. Ice cube, it's a lot easier to see. Now in terms of motion, this is what we would visualize. Um, we can see it here. In this, this show you. Well, this is start off with ice. You know, ice, it doesn't have to be zero. It could be at less than zero degrees C, but ice has a very open um, structure like this. So what this is just showing is it's just showing how the uh, water molecules are oriented with each other. Each, each water molecule would have two hydrogens bonded to it, but these other lines here, you know, it looks like there are a lot more. There's dashed lines there, it's hard to see. But those dashed lines are just showing the shape of things, you know. When you look at it, it's a very open structure, ice. It's not very dense. This is why ice floats on top of water, because it has this very open. This is what we call a crystal structure. Crystal structure, ice forms very nice crystals, like snowflakes and whatnot. And that's because everything's so well ordered. When you have things well ordered like this, um, it tends to form nice crystals. And so this is solid, oops, lost connection. Okay. Well, solid ice, and then uh, what we do is we heat it up. So this is a bigger ice crystal. What's the smallest ice crystal we could have? It would consist of one molecule, one molecule of water. And so you just build bigger crystals like this. So this ice cube here. Now start heating up the ice cube, what's gonna happen? Um, things are gonna start moving <coughs> faster. Now, what type of motion do you see in ice? 
vibrational. Do you see any rotational? There's no rotational. Do you see any translational? No. The rotate. But uh, take a look at the surfaces of the ice cube, in particular, like the top surface here and the bottom surface. Now, now look at what's happening at the top surface. You know, it's starting to melt there. When it's starting to melt, what types of motion do you see there? Rotational, Rotational and translational. And so that's a big difference. In solids, there's only vibrational motion, no rotational, no translational. But in liquids, we have all vibrational. It depends on the molecule, you know. Um, or if it's just atoms, then rotating atoms, we don't really think of it being rotational motion. But, but we have all three types of motion available. And so you can see we're melting more and more of the ice here on the surfaces. Unfor unfortunately, this simulation gets cut short. This is a modeling based on the theory. This isn't an actual video, but this is what was predicted based on the theory of the chemistry. And so we're just melting more. I'd like to melt all of it, but it's going to end right now. And so it didn't melt all of it. And so that was a, a pretty good um, simulation of melting here. This is another simulation of melting. This one's going to melt the whole thing, but this one's less accurate, probably. Simulation. Uh huh. So for gas, is it all three as well? For gases, yes. Okay. All three types of motions. We'll take a look at the gas shortly. Okay, so this is very rapid melting of that ice cube. And then this will collapse into the rest of the water there. And you can see the motion. Okay, let's take a look at a uh, boiling simulation there. This is called molecular dynamics. Again, um, they aren't actually taking videos of the real thing. It's just um, modeling based on the theory. I guess this is only one thing. Simulation of melting and vaporizing water. Simulation by PHET Interactive Simulations, University of Colorado, PHET.colorado.edu. This molecular simulation shows how the macroscopic properties of water change as we increase the heat energy added to the water molecules. Atoms are displayed as balls and atoms bonded together and molecules are shown in contact with each other. Water at minus 116 Celsius is well below its freezing point of zero Celsius. Each water molecule is shown as a red oxygen atom with two small white hydrogen atoms connected with two strong polar covalent bonds. Each molecule has two hydrogen atoms bonded to a red oxygen atom in a bent molecular shape. We see many water molecules very closely packed together, moving in place and not moving away from the nearest neighbors. Between different water molecules, the hydrogen in one molecule is close to an oxygen atom in a different water molecule. Yeah, this this There's isn't as accurate. There's some spaces in this collection of molecules. This is just this a is solid water, where it has a definite shape and volume, and the molecules are very close together. This uh, actually over exaggerated the motion. As we add heat energy by putting a fire under the container, we see the temperature increase and the water molecules moving faster. Molecules are still close together, but they lose the open spaces. The volume is shrunk due to losing the open spaces between molecules. Some molecules can now move away from neighbors, and a few leave the group and move up into the container. Okay, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Reason? Let's get to the boiling water. And some molecules have enough energy to escape into the vapor or gas phase. 
Raising the temperature to well above 100 C, the boiling point of water, the molecules are no longer close together. Molecules move in straight lines until they hit another molecule or collide with the container walls. Okay, that's probably good. Yeah. So, uh, let's take a look. Go back to this. So there are a couple of things. One other thing I wanted to emphasize, in addition to what he was saying in the video, is this: what holds the water molecules together? You know, when we're looking at this, a lot of people think you know the reason why the water mo molecules are held together is because of gravity. Would you agree? Yeah. Gravity is holding the water molecules together. No, it's not because of gravity. What's holding the water molecules together? Well, <clears throat> well, in other words, we have an individual water molecule here and another one here. These two water molecules are being held together by what? <coughs> what they're being held together by is not gravity. What they're being held together by uh, is, another, is an electrical type force, which we call intermolecular force of attraction. But don't, you don't have to write it down yet because we're going to talk about these in detail later. In other words, the water molecules are sticky. They get stuck together, and that like if you go to the fountain, you know I was that in downtown LA. There's a fountain that shoots up huge drops of water. You know these big globules of water are shooting up in the in the air, and you see, you know the surface is changing. It's very fluid, but it doesn't break apart, and the water molecules aren't flying all over the place. It's stuck together like a ball. You know, and I was thinking, wow, the water molecules are really sticky. They don't want to. Uh, break apart. They want to stick together. And so here, you know, the temperature is kind of low. They're just stuck. And then as you heat it, yeah, it's going to loosen them up, right? And then you got to heat it to a very high temperature to get it to boil. Here we've got to overcome, you know, the, the stickiness of the water molecules in order, and that, that requires a lot of energy, you know, a pretty high temperature, 100 degrees C to do that. But in other words, this. In solids and liquids, the water molecules touch each other because they're stuck to one another. In gases, do the water molecules touch each other? No, the water molecules are independent. They can come together in a collision, you know, but if they start collecting and together they're gonna form a bigger and bigger drop, and that bigger and bigger drop is gonna condense into a droplet of liquid. Uh -huh. Is surface tension caused by like, the stickiness? Yeah, exactly. The surface tension is caused by the stickiness. You know, the water molecules Get stuck together. Surface tension is how hard is it to break the surface of water? And um, it's not it it's not so easy to break the surface of water because in order to break the surface of water, um, you have to separate those water molecules that are kind of stuck together. And so, have you seen this demo of surface tension? Let me see. This is it. So if I have a paper clip like this, right? The paper clip is more dense than water, so if it's more dense than water, it should sink. sink. But since the water molecules are kind of sticky, um, if I just gently put this on the surface, maybe I could get this thing to float. Let's see if I can. If I have some tweezers here. And this is something, of course, you could do. Yeah, I don't have tweezers. Tongs. So these are tongs. These are crucible tongs, but this might not work. I want to, just a fine pair of tweezers. These tongs are going to break the surface. I didn't want that to happen, but I'll try it anyway. Let's see if it can get this to float here on the surface. No, I can. I have one more. I can give it a try. Let me try this one. Although this one, this one's plastic coated. Let's see. I might, re I might retry that other one, but we'll see. Got to make sure that there's no waves in the water here. There. There you go. 
So do you see it? It's floating. Can you see that? That's because the water molecules are kind of sticky, and so in order to to get it to sink, we got to break the water molecules apart from each other, and they don't want to do that, basically. However, if I add something called a surfactant, um, the surfactants uh, get in the way. The surfactants sneak in between the water molecules and weaken the surface tension or weaken the stickiness. And so soap will do that. So there's a little, like a little magic trick here that people do. Like, I'll just get a drop of soap, this. If I put a drop of soap there, and then that soap will just spread out slowly, right? And then when that soap hits the area where the um, paper clip is, let's see what happens. Hmm. Let me put another drop. I'll put another drop of soap. I'm going to put the drop of soap along the side so it doesn't disturb the surface. Maybe this, this soap is, this soap might be a little too viscous. <laughs> this might be a little bit better. Let me try that. Uh, it, it just takes time. Eventually it'll work. It just got, it take too much time to get over there. So I'm going to use some Windex. I'm going to put it down the side. Did you see that? Yeah. Well, it, it's supposed to be more dramatic than that, but I mean, <laughs> Because uh, maybe it was disturbed, but basically once it hits there, now if you try to try to float it, it's not going to float. You know, um, so you could do that. You could make a bet with your friend. You know, I can float a paper clip, uh, but you can't. You know, <laughs> and then put a little drop of soap in there. Oh, okay. well, that's you don't win. <laughs> yeah, that would be messed up. But yeah, just all in the name of fun. Yes, at the expense. Um, so, we're going to talk about, you know, how molecules stick to one another later, you know, what exactly that involves uh, in more detail because we want to know. I mean, that's our observations. When we have observations like that, then we want to figure out what the more detailed description of what's happening is. Okay, but that's basically at the particulate level. And so, um, that's going to do uh, a couple of things. One, uh, the density, you know, um, solids and liquids are a lot more dense than gases. You know, density is how much matter you have per cubic centimeter, usually. And so these are going to have a lot more matter compared to this, you know, these molecules are going to be spread out. But there's also something called compressibility. You know, can you compress them? So ice, is it possible to compress ice? Not really. A little bit, yeah, but not, not much. Water? Can you compress water? No. You can't compress ice or water because the molecules are already touching one another. But gases, can you compress gases? Yes. Gases are compressible. For macroscopic, that's kind of the particulate level. For macroscopic, then we usually look at things in terms of shape, you know. So macroscopically, gases will have variable shape depending on the container. And we'll just drop the shape of the container. Liquids have variable shape. They'll just fill the bottom of the container. Solids are rigid. And they'll have whatever shape they've frozen. So the volume, the volume is variable for gases. It can be compressed or even expanded. You know, um, but for liquids and solids, it's fairly constant. You know, it doesn't change much. All right. Um, things like compressibility, you know, like compressibility is what we call a physical property because of this. When you compress something, is it still water? Like compressed water versus uncompressed water, it's the same thing. It's just water. Um, boiling. And boiling is what we call a physical property because um, in liquid water, we have water molecules. In gaseous water, we also have water molecules. So it went from H2O to H2O. Nothing changed. And so in physical properties and physical changes, um, physical changes occur with um, no change in the chemical identity. You know, it's still H2O. And so um, things like melting point, which is the temperature at which uh, ice melts, or boiling point, the temperature at which water boils, those would be physical properties. 
However, if we have something like methane, we, we burn methane, you know, are the products of um, burning methane the same? Like, after I burn the methane, do I still have methane? No. no. That would be a chemical property. You know, and we talked about this earlier. Do you recall what I said about, you know, another reason why atoms won out over infinitely divisible matter? It's because in chemical changes, like burning methane, what happens to the atoms? Do the atoms disappear or reappear? They just get rearranged. The atoms are just all there. And so originally we had a carbon atom and methane. Did I show methane earlier? I didn't show methane? Maybe. You know? Uh, is that the gray fight? Um, let me see if I show it. I thought I, I, I showed it, but let me just skip this one. This is methane. This shape is this shape is a very common shape. Pretty soon, if you don't know the name of the shape, you'll know the name by the end of the semester because it's a very common shape. This molecule. So tetrahedral is the shape of this. But anyway, we have carbon in the center and then four hydrogens. And so what happens is that methane molecule, when it combusts, you know, we end up forming, do you know what forms with combustion? Energy. Water, energy, and carbon dioxide. Sometimes, you know, um, we like carbon dioxide to form, but sometimes we don't have enough air, you know. Um, sometimes this burner isn't properly tuned. If it's not properly tuned, not enough air is getting in there, it's oxygen starved, what are we going to form? Carbon monoxide. Not good. Um, is it possible? Hey, you know what? If I'm forming a lot of carbon monoxide, I better add a little bit more air. And so if I add a little bit more air, maybe I can form this. You know, just a little bit more air, 1.23, rather than the CO. Will this happen? <coughs> um, well, why not? I want 1.23 um, atoms worth of oxygen. And it's not going to happen. Right? Uh, because um, That's because theories need to do what? Predict. Predict. And what did that theory predict? What did Dalton, did I talked about Dalton's atomic theory, right? So can you tell me a little bit about Dalton's atomic theory? What did Dalton's atomic theory predict? What evidence did Dalton use to um, propose atoms? I'm jumping ahead, but I, you know, I, I, this is why when we were reviewing it, it's okay if you don't have it down. But you know, it's better if you had it down. Uh huh. The, the what? Yeah, the balloon in the bottle. What was the what was going on with the balloon in the bottle? What was the take-home message for that? What's the mass that? is the same. The mass is the same. Based on the law of conservation of mass, the atoms must all be there. They just must be rearranged, right? This is why uh, the phlogiston theory would fail. Why would the phlogiston theory fail? This is what you do, you know, the thing is, first you gotta just accumulate the knowledge. You know, you can't really apply it, because applying it, you gotta get it into your subconscious, and when you get into your subconscious, then it uh, apparently builds these neural connections. Have you ever had this happen? Have you ever had this um, question, and you, the answer's at the tip of your tongue, yeah but you can't think of it. And then later on, you're, you're shopping. This happened to me. <laughs> this happened to me at Ralph's. You know, the, the final exams at UCLA are pretty tough. You know, they don't expect people to finish. But there's one question that was really bugging me, but I ran out of time, and I didn't finish it. And so right after the test, I wanted to go get a, uh, some kind of food and snack at Ralph's, so I'm sitting at the checkout line, and then boom, it hits me. I could, oh man, if I just had like, what was it? If I just had 15 more minutes or whatever, 20 more minutes, I forgot. It wasn't that. Ross is right there next to the campus. <laughs> <laughs> I would have had it. Just 20, you know, it's just that time delay. And so the sooner you can get it into your, you know, and how do you get it in? Well, you got to memorize some stuff first. And when you memorize it, then it gets in there. The sooner you get it in, the more you can apply that knowledge. 
And so, you know, some things seem kind of random, out of place, but, you know, the competing theory with uh, the, the um, phlogiston theory or whatever it was, and the atom, atom theory, atomic theory, right? And phlogiston, it, it can't be, right? It can't be because the mass, would change. the mass would change. If this stuff disappeared, the mass would change or should change. And so, you know, if, if you were reviewing that work, you'd say, you know, what's, how can it be? How can the mass not change if you're losing, you know, phlogiston? Well, uh, you would ask the, the, whoever proposed that, I don't even know the name of the person who proposed the theory, but it's probably been going around this whole time. So those are the types of things that you can um, think about. Let's go. But uh, also, the theory led to what? Atomic theory led to the law of conservation of mass. No, conserv the law of conservation of mass led to the theory, but the theory must be able to predict new unforeseen results. What was the new unforeseen result that atomic theory predicted? Like, for example, gravitational theory could predict the gravity on the moon, you know, right? That is, uh, how long it would take an apple to drop on the moon versus how long it would take to drop on Earth without having to travel to the moon to measure it. You know, if we didn't have the theory, we'd have to go out to the moon. We'd either assume it's the same on the moon, or we'd go out to the moon and measure it. But do you want to be dropping apples on the moon, you know, fly out there? To, no. So that's the power of theory. The power of theory is, and this is why, you know, Newton's law is okay, that's okay. Force equals ma, but, you know, um, a would be, you know, gravitational, but it, what we call gravitational, it's, it's the constant, acceleration constant. See, maybe yesterday, if I had asked this yesterday, People would, a lot more people would probably remember, you know, yesterday. But, you know, memory fades quickly. There was one other law I talked about yesterday. Did anybody write it down? Uh-huh. So, the, uh, the law of constant combustion? E combustion? Uh, okay. Combustion. Yeah, there you'd go. Um, you, you'd have to, you know, what you do is you, not only do you write it down, but you write what it means. To, to you, and then you, what would the law of combustion do? You know, maybe the law of combustion would be a form of CO2 in water when you burn organics. That could be it. But it, it, you're close. It wasn't the law of combustion. And this is another thing I'd do. Uh, you know, after class, I would, I would. Um, this is why you need the book. You you use the book and you cross-reference things in the book and make sure everything's correct and accurate in your notes because it's the law of. Did you get it? Uh, constant composition. Yeah, the law of constant composition. And um, in a nutshell, tell me what the law of constant composition is in your own words. See, the thing is, the thing is, you know, when I went to UCLA, um, there was one other thing that I had to contend with there, and that was. Uh, it was a lot more competitive, a lot more competitive. Um, and that is, uh, I, I had a, in my class a lot of people who, whose dream was ever since they were in kindergarten to go to medical school, be some, become some kind of surgeon. And they were going to do whatever it takes to do that. And so they wanted the top score in the class, you know, in every class. And they worked hard to get it, you know. And so the, what happens is it sets up kind of a, a a bimodal distribution. You have those people who are willing to do everything to get that top score and a, a group of them and that's going to push the curve up higher and higher. And then you have the normal people who don't want to devote, you know, or maybe whatever. But all of a sudden you're going to have to shift too. Otherwise the curve shifts. The curve shifts, then you got to shift with the curve. You know. And so there are going to be people who are on it. You know, people who every single word that you know, people who have the recorder uh, this is in the old days, they all have the, the recorder, recording, if it's okay, you know, not every class it's okay to record. But if it was okay to record, they'd have the recorder on and they wouldn't miss a word they said, and they'd know everything that was said. And so, um, just, 
you don't have to be at that level, but you know you want to uh, make sure you get as much in, uh, the information as possible, and then put it in your own words. So, uh, putting it, the law of constant composition in your own words. Can you give me an example of law of constant composition? Uh huh. Okay, matter can neither be created nor destroyed is um, that's the um, well, another way of saying the law of conservation of mass. No matter what they did to the matter, the the mass always stayed the same. And so that's that's another way of saying that uh, the mass is conserved or law of conservation of mass. Before and after, you're going to have the same mass. So what you want to do is you want to make a little note, you know, because that's the way you'll remember it. If you have just written down law of constant composition and you never think about it once, then when it comes to the test, you, you aren't going to know, you know, and you're, there's no way you can apply it, you know. And so normally what you do is you, you, if, you, if it doesn't make sense, then you start looking, you know. I would do, of course you look in the book, and... Um, I'm, uh, although I'm deviating, and so I, 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 I understand that, um, yeah. the book called it constant composition. I didn't. You, does anybody re recall what I called it? Um, the book called it law of constant composition. I called it law of multiple proportions. Law, I, that's what I called it. Law of multiple proportions. What is the law of multiple proportions? The law of multiple proportions says this. It says, yes, I, I would expect H2O, and I would expect H2O2, um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily expect H2O 2.005. You know. I wouldn't expect that. Why? Because you can't have a part of an atom. You can't have a part of an atom. I mean, we could, uh, maybe maybe I have this wrong. Maybe it's actually you know H2000, so I have 2,000 hydrogens and 2,005 oxygens. If that's the case, I have this gigantic molecule, that's okay, you know, because it has to be in whole number ratios, otherwise we, we can't have fractions of atoms. This is the whole point of this carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide thing. That was the whole point of the joke with H2O2, you know, um, it was because of the law of multiple proportions, that is, everything has to be in whole number ratios. And so, if you think about it, you know, yeah, okay, I made brief mention of that yesterday, but there are going to be people, you know, if you go to wherever, UCLA, there are going to be people who, whose dream is it is to go to UCLA Medical School. And you better believe they're going to know everything. Everything, I said. Because um, I sat in classes with those people, and then I had to change. Of course, I had to change. Otherwise, I wasn't going to keep up. And so they shifted the, the curve, and you could say whatever you want about them, but they shifted the curve up, and so you got to sh go along with it. Okay. And so that's that was one of the big things. Um, you know, I, I I changed my study habits. You know, I, I didn't let little things slide like that. You know, I try to catch everything. But anyway, you could read about law of definite proportions, law of constant composition, law of multiple proportions. In our book or online or whatever. And so that's a good example to use in the scientific method. You know, it's CH4 in this case. And when we burn it, we're going to, those carbon atoms are going to end up in CO2, maybe CO. Maybe CO, but definitely not CO 1.23. Now, there are things that form a lot of ratios. For example, this. Have you heard of NOx? Yeah, NOx. Um, 
NOx, like when you go get your car emission tested, they're going to measure the NOx. They're going to measure the NOx because when you burn, um, some, some nitrogen in air burns with the oxygen to form oxides of nitrogen like this. And so we can form NO2, we can form NO2, we can form N2O. N2O is laughing gas. There. And there are different oxides of nitrogen that can form. And you end up with a mixture of these things. Hopefully we don't end up with too much of a mixture of these here. Uh, we want the, just the CO2. CO2 is also toxic, but it's safer. Where do the hydrogens in methane end up? The hydrogens end up where? In water. Right? Um, because you burn methane and oxygen, and so the oxygen and the hydrogen combine to form water. All right, uh, so those are chemical changes. Um, chemical changes are chemical properties. You know, I call this, and this is a problem with the book. The book, um, well, this is more in line with the dictionary de definition. What did I say about that dictionary definition? Remember the dictionary definition? I, I, I printed that out in the um, course info sheet. What did I say about that? I, I said I didn't like it because. Yeah, uh, because chemical reactions, chemical changes should be classified as chemical yeah. rea well, chemical properties. Right? This is more, and this is kind of in line with your book, you know. Your book is saying there are physical properties with physical change, and then they're talking about chemical changes and chemical properties. So actually your book is in line with what I was saying. And so there are two types of properties. There's physical properties and chemical properties. The main difference between them is that in physical properties, you know, we don't rearrange all the atoms. All the atoms are still as they were, and in fact, all the compounds or elements, uh, compounds I'll talk more about later, but all the uh, molecules and atoms are, are uh, unchanged. Whereas um, in chemical changes, we rearrange the atoms to make um, new molecules. And so here's a physical change. This is, this is ice. You can see the very open structure of ice. It's, it's very orderly. When we have an orderly structure, do you know what we call it? Crystalline. If it's somewhat disordered, do you know what we call it? If it's a little bit disordered, we call it not crystalline. Hmm? Amorphous. Amorphous. I was on this slide earlier. So amorphous um, solids, they lack a pattern in the arrangement. Uh, and so for example, wax. Uh, wax is pretty uh, um, semi-amorphous. It's, it's semi-amorphous. It doesn't form beautiful crystals you know, like uh, other, other things. But, so even if you tried to grow wax crystals, you're going to have a hard time growing wax crystals because it just doesn't. It's not to say that, you know, um, you can't uh, for certain types of waxes. It's just much more difficult, mm -hmm. lacking the order. Um, and so a lot of people think, when they think about amorphous um, solid, they think about frozen liquids. If you were to take this liquid and freeze it rapidly right here, would it, everything be nice and orderly? It, uh, OK, you freeze the motion right now, nothing can move. Everything's frozen in its random place. So it takes time. Crystallization is a process. You know, when things crystallize, it takes a little bit of time because everything has to find their place. Every water molecule has to move into the right position and then it'll freeze. You know? So sometimes growing crystals is hard. Because they don't want to do that. But here, it, this is um, nice, nicely crystalline. This is a liquid, so we wouldn't say it's amorphous because the amorphous is usually reserved just for solids. It is kind of amorphous because it's not in that structure. Anyway, boiling is a chemical, uh, chemical or physical change. Bo boiling. Physical. Uh, but that's boiling. Melting. Physical. physical. Do you know the opposite of boiling? What that process is called? Condensation. And the opposite of melting? Freezing. Freezing. 
let's try to melt sugar. If we try to melt sugar, um, we might be successful. Uh, we might not be. So this is our sugar, and we melt the sugar, and then we continue trying to melt the sugar. Was that very successful? No. Um, in fact, this would be an example of a chemical change. Some things, you know, what happens is, as you heat this up, sugar combusts and burn the stuff. So we burn it a little bit here. So we have some burned sugar. It's not going to be the same. Eventually, it's just going to be um, carbon or soot type deposits and taste awful. In this case, it'll probably still taste pretty good. Caramelized sugar. That's an example of chemical change. Uh, other things like uh, ice, you know, you can heat this stuff up, it's not going to burn. Will, will ice burn like this? No. You see this up here is uh, what we term um, an equation. Here. Here's the before, here's the after. And so whenever we have a process, um, a process could be like a melting ice or a reaction, like burning sugar. Um, we can draw an equation for that. And so um, sugar is known by uh, sucrose. This is just table sugar. We call it the, the reactant. Um, this is what we're starting with. And then we have this process of reaction and we form the products. In this case, carbon, which is the black stuff in the water. Sugar is known as a carbohydrate. You know, carbohydrate. The name comes from carbon and water. Hydrate. Hydration or hydrate. Although it's not carbon and water. Or now, now at the end it looks like carbon and water, but before it's not carbon and water and sugar. It just has the, the ratio. Why they call it carbohydrate is because the hydrogen and oxygen always has a certain ratio to it. And so, for example, um, so actually, a little bit more complicated. It doesn't always work out. But if we look at, um, like, uh, sucrose is made up of a glucose. Glucose is C12, C6H12O6. And so look at the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. What's the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen? Two to one. So this is like carbohydrate, but it's not water. This is not water for sure. This is glucose. Sucrose is a little bit more tricky because it doesn't look like the ratios there. Sucrose has this formula, you know, C12, H22O11. Oh, does it? Is that right? Yeah, this would be sucrose. So it's the carbohydrate, because the hydrogen to oxygen ratio is 2 to 1 again. <laughs> but if you, if you started looking for carbon and water molecules, carbon atoms and water molecules and sugar, you're going to <laughs> um, not find any at all. Because if we look at the structure of the molecule itself and see how the carbons and the hydrogens are all attached to, to one another, Look at the structure. I'm going to do the crystal structure. This is using the, uh, what do they call that? You know, we had the ball and stick, we had the space filling. Remember that? Ball and stick space filling. What was this one called? You don't need to know this, but I'm just curious if anybody caught it. This one was called the wire. You know, it looks like wire attached. This just shows the general structure. Uh, we also saw ribbon and sheets. Do you remember ribbon and sheets? Did I mention those as well? Yeah, there's different ways of representing a structure. Actually, is this sucrose? It's 
doesn't look like food press. Sorry, I might have gotten it. Wrong. This would be more of a, this would be a, a tiny sucrose crystal here. No, we have, this would be a single molecule, and then the molecules pack together to form a nice crystal in a well-ordered arrangement. Ball and stick. Ball and stick. And so, but you aren't gonna find any water molecules there. We got oxygens here. So I see carbon, oxygen, hydrogen here. No H O H. And the carbon, oxygen, carbon linked together. And bonded together. Um, okay, what, what is your preference? Um, is your preference to take a break in the middle or end earlier and just go straight through? Here's your preference. End earlier. End earlier. Go to, to take a quick vote if you want. End earlier. Take a break. All right, we'll, um, we'll continue. I'm gonna end early, a little early. I have to end a little earlier than normal today because I have an appointment right up for me. So, um, but let me just continue then. You do um, you need to. You're welcome to um, uh, take take breaks whenever you need. Um, like All right. So again, um, chemical change. Now, when we're looking at matter, um, you know. We have to worry, is the matter pure or impure? Like, for example, this water. Is the water pure or impure? Is this distilled water? If this were distilled water, is it pure or impure? <coughs> Impure? If it's distilled, it should be pure. Distillation is a process of purification. And so if it's distilled, you would assume it's pure. Unless it got contaminated. If it's tap water, is it pure? Impure. Impure, yeah. Tap water is going to have stuff dissolved in it. Distilled water could potentially get some um, gases get back in there, you know, like air, a little bit of air, but still it's probably pure. How about the air in this room? Is it pure air? What is pure air? Nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen and oxygen, okay, that would be pure. Is there um, anywhere on earth that would have pure air in that case? Let's say inside the lab, would the lab be pure? Because, uh, well, it depends on how much nitrogen, how much oxygen. Mm 
But what was that again? Sorry. It's forty-nine percent nitrogen, and fifty percent oxygen, and ten percent Okay. Um, yeah, that's a that's a problem with it. Um, let's say uh, I was advertising pure lemonade, one hundred percent. Well, no, I shouldn't do that. Let's say, how about um, pure iced coffee? Uh, I was advertising pure iced coffee. Right. Is that possible to have pure iced coffee? Why not? Is it okay? Let's remove the ice, so it's just the coffee. Is that pure? It has water in it, right? And the situation comes uh, like sugar water. If you want pure sugar water, is it possible to have pure sugar water? You could have sugar and water, and that could be pure, but what is pure sugar water? Pure sugar water would be, you know, if, if that's the case, you know, some people might mix <coughs> a tiny fraction of sugar in a whole lot of water, other people will mix a whole bunch of sugar. And so sugar water will vary in terms of sweetness. Okay. If sugar water varies in terms of sweetness, then it's what we call a mixture. Anything that has a variable composition is termed a mixture. Now let's get back to air. Does air have a fixed composition or a variable composition? Variable. It's variable, so we call it a mixture. Are air purifiers falsely estimated? Uh, air purifiers? Um, not, not, not necessarily. Um, because one, there's really no such thing as pure air. Because the air, even, even if you got, they're, they're talking about pollutants and uh, particulates and whatnot. Even if you got rid of those, the air here, is, is it going to be the same as the air in Denver? No. no. You know, even after purification? No, it, the composition is going to be a little different. Is the air here going to be the same as the air on top of Everest? No. no. And so, of course, uh, uh, the air purifiers are good because they'll get rid of certain pollutants in the air. But um, air being a, a mixture, um, we can't. Now, there are some things that we want. Uh, we want some certain high purity mixtures, you know. Um, and so it is a little bit tricky there. So if you're going to make some synthetic air, you know, if you're going to make some synthetic air, then you don't want any to add the pollutants in there. What would you mix together? Well, let's take a look at the composition of air. And air is very, varies, but we'll just, you know, look at the average composition of air. And uh, that's all we can get. So this is kind of the average composition of air here. Um, the average composition of air is going to contain 78% nitrogen. Now, when we have a percentage, uh, you guys know what the percentage represents. Uh, 78 parts per 100 parts. Now, when they have a percentage like that, does it mean that if I had 100 grams of air, would that be 78 grams of nitrogen for every 100 grams of air? Or would that be, if I had 100 molecules of air, I'd have 78 molecules of air? Okay. Well, it, it's not entirely clear, but in this case, it's percentage by molecules. So if I had 100 molecules, 78 molecules, well, I can't have 0.08 molecules, can I? So what I do is I move the decimal place over. So if I had 10,000 molecules, 7,808 molecules would be nitrogen molecules. And how many oxygen molecules would I have? I'd have 2,095. And then I'd go on. I'd have um, uh, 93 argon. Does argon does not form molecules. It would be just atoms of argon. And argon is what we call a Nobel gas like helium. It's not very reactive. Uh, I, I'd need a lot more molecules just to get one atom of xenon. I'd have like 1.8 
atoms of neon, um, not much hydrogen with the helium, kryptonic, carbon dioxide. <coughs> and so that's the composition. So roughly, it's about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. So I can mix up my own air, you know, like that. But since it doesn't have a fixed composition, you know, um, people can mix it differently. Whereas if you have a water purifier, you know, that's a different matter. Because the, the water you should get after purification should be pure. pure. It should just be water. Right? And, um, okay, so that's the difference. Pure matter or pure substance. Substance is just matter. In fact, um, pure matter and substances are often used inter interchangeably sometimes. Not always. But, but it, it, it just um, has fixed composition, uh, not variable composition. And therefore, its properties are going to be fixed. You know, um, whereas mixtures like sugar water will have variable composition and therefore variable properties. Sugar water depends. It could be sweeter or less sweet. The more sugar in there, the more dense it's going to be. So, for example, um, Coke. You know, if you take a, a can of Coke, will it sink in water or float in water? Or what would it do, sink or float? A can of Coke sinks in water because it's mostly sugar water. Sugar water is more dense, it, it sinks. A can of Diet Coke? Isn't that more sugar? Hmm? Um, I don't have to demo that. This is a demo. This is a Coke versus Diet Coke. Maybe I'll fast forward this. Is that a diet drink or a regular drink? You got a lot of sugar in the water, it's going to make it more dense. You know, there's more matter packed in per cubic centimeter. <laughs> Do they weigh the same? No, they don't weigh the same. They don't. Which one weighs more? The Coke is going to weigh more. It's got more grams of sugar in there. And then the, um, the sweetener that they use for the diet, they use barely use any. I mean, it's very, um, and so it doesn't weigh, weigh as much. So the density of coke. The same thing with um, other properties. The boiling point of water is fixed. Pure water boils at 100 degrees C. But if I tried to boil sugar water or salt water, what happens is the boiling point um, isn't fixed. The boiling point depends on how much sugar is in the water or how much salt is in the water. As more water boils off, it gets um, more concentrated. You know, as you boil off the water, and as it gets more concentrated, the boiling point creeps up. So this graph is showing the temperature at which it boils versus time. So this is why it's changing. 
Uh, in other words, the the point of this slide is not to know the angle. The point of this slide is not. Is the point of this slide is pure substance of fixed properties. Mixtures have variable properties depending on the composition of the mixture. So this is just an exercise. Is this pure or a mixture? When we look at it macroscopically, I can't tell. When I look at this macroscopically, it looks pure to me because it, it looks uniform. When something looks uniform, we call it homogeneous. And so this looks homogeneous, it looks uniform, it looks pure. Is it? Well, we need to, we need to test its properties to determine if it's pure or not, or we need to analyze it. In this case, um, if we had a, something that could look at the molecules themselves, which we don't have something that can easily look at the molecules like this, um, we would see that this has got to be pure. This is bromine. Bromine likes to form um, these two atom molecules like this. And that's why we call it Br2. It just likes to do that. Uh, this would be pure water, this is in the water molecules. When we look at this though, this also looks homogeneous, so this looks pure, you know, it looks uniform throughout. When something's heterogeneous, non-uniform, then we start thinking it's a mixture, but it turns out that this is not pure, this is a mixture, this is bromine molecules dissolved in water. Now the concentration of that can, can change, so for example, if we add more bromine, we get a more concentrated solution. And so bromine water is a mixture. It doesn't have a fixed composition because we could vary the composition from dilute to concentrated. Dilute bromine is going to have a way different amount than concentrated. It's going to have a different density. It's going to have a different boiling point, freezing point, etc. Okay, so uh, pure substances and mixtures. And those mixtures that we look, just looked at are called solutions. Solutions are mixtures that look very uniform. So for example, um, the air in this room, is it pure or mixture? It's, it's a mixture. <clears throat> but it looks very uniform. It looks pure. And so we call it a, a solution. It's a solution. Solutions are homogeneous mixtures of two or more substances. Homogeneous means they have a uniform and uh, you know they're going to have uniform properties as well. Uniform properties. What I mean by um, variable versus fixed is once you have a certain composition, you know once the air is fixed in composition, although we can vary the amounts of nitrogen and oxygen, once the air is fixed in composition, then its properties are going to be fixed. You know as long as the composition doesn't change, the properties should stay the same. It's like sugar water. If you always mix it in the same ratio every morning, is it going to taste the same mm -hmm. each time? Yeah, it's going to taste the same. So in that sense, the properties are fixed. In another sense, the properties aren't fixed. Let's say you ran short on sugar. If you ran short on sugar and you have a little less sugar, then the property is going to be different. You know? But as long as you make it the same each time, then you're okay. Properties will be fixed. Okay, now heterogeneous are going to have multi phases. What, they, what I mean by multi phases is, is this. This slide is, sorry, this is always not the clear slide. But um, ice water. Is ice water, now ice water, this is kind of tricky. Is ice water pure or mixture? Well, it, yeah, it, in one sense it's pure because it just consists of water. You know, ice is water, water is water. In another sense, it's heterogeneous. I mean, it's, it's a mixture. It's a mixture because I, ha I can have different ratios of ice to water. You know, sometimes, I, you know, when I drink ice water, I like the perfect ratio of ice to water. You know, not too much ice, not too little ice, you know, whatever that is. And so, um, in that sense, it's, it's heterogeneous in terms of phases, but not in terms of composition. But anyway, when, tip, when things are heterogeneous, they typically have non-uniform composition. They're heterogeneous in terms of composition, like sand and water. If you have sand and water, that's not pure. That's a mixture. It's a mixture of sand and water. And that would be non-uniform in appearance. So let's take a look at some examples here. Um, this, you recognize what's in here just by looking at the molecules? H2O. H2O. 
Um, can you recognize this molecule? These look like little dots here. Um, but these are these these are two carbons. And one carbon has all hydrogens. This has an OH. This is called uh, ethanol. Ethanol. This is pure ethanol. Pure ethanol is not easy to get. It's called uh, absolute ethanol. It's because of the way it's purified. You know, we, we can pur purify a lot of things like distillation, like distilled water. Ethanol you can't purify by distillation. The, you know what the purest form of ethanol you can get by distillation is? Is it 90, 90? What's the highest proof alcohol available? 100% would be 200 proof alcohol. You know, if you go to Nevada, what's the highest? You can't get it in California. I don't really drink so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't really drink this. <laughs> but I did drink this at one time. I just wanted to <laughs> <laughs> But the thing was. Are you still was, in college? <laughs> um, actually, I made it. I made it in oh. college. As well. Oh, oh. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> It was, uh, it was in, in chemistry. That's, that's probably why. Uh, yeah. But um, the, let me tell you, when it hit my tongue, it evaporated. Like, I thought, like, oh, it's not very, it's not what I was expecting. But um, I think it's 180, 190, 190 proof. 190 proof um, is not pure. 190 proof alcohol is 95% alcohol by volume. That's the highest proof you can get by distillation. So that's what I did. I, I, um, first, I fermented some sugar with yeast, and then uh, distilled the mixture. You know, this is all part of it. You know, um, so you have a. I put in a whole bunch of sucrose in here. You know, sugar, and then some yeast, and then I put a balloon over this. This is all part of the experiment. And then fermentation takes place. The fermentation is going to make alcohol. And so it makes ethanol. Ethanol has the formula we call CH3CH2OH. Ethanol. But now my, all my ethanol is mixed in. I don't want to drink yeast. And then there's leftover sugar and some other junk in here. And then the balloon's grown big because now the balloon has CO2 in it. Yeah. So you have this nasty mixture here that you don't want to drink. And so what you do, well, this, this is one of the big challenges in science. One of the big challenges is oftentimes we have mixtures. We don't want mixtures. We want to isolate one component of the mixture and get that pure. And so the goal here was I wanted to isolate the ethanol you know, and separate it from all the other stuff. Well, the easy thing to do there is to distill because ethanol has a very low boiling point. And so if you start heating this up, you can distill it. And normally when you distill things, you can get it pure. But ethanol is funny because a little bit of water tags along. And a little bit of water that tags along, and so this is going to be just water and alcohol. It's going to be 95% 95, 95 alcohol, ethanol, and 5% water. Now you have, to be watch, you have to watch out because every year, you know, because I'm a chemist, so I read the chemistry journals. And you don't see this in the news, but every year I read about deaths, deaths from drinking alcohol. This is called grain alcohol because you could use sugar or you could use grains to make alcohol. But there's another type of alcohol that people try to make. Um, and, uh, and the other type of alcohol that people try to make is by putting wood in here and then fermenting wood. Have you ever heard of that? It's called wood alcohol. And the only difference between wood alcohol and grain alcohol is one carbon atom. That's it. And so rather than having two carbon atoms like this, methanol has one carbon atom, CH3OH. And so I, in the chemistry journals, you hear about this because it's chemistry and people are interested in it. But you don't hear. Like, what was it, last year or two years ago, like 13 people died from drinking wood alcohol? 
not only that, the survivors, uh, some of them were permanently blinded because the methanol will attack your optical nerves when it's metabolized in your body and cause permanent blindness. This is not, um, this is not uh, what they call those tails. This is not like an urban myth. This is real, you know. Um, methanol will cause blindness. It's not to, to prevent you from drinking, but um, ethanol won't. Ethanol in small quantities is not fun. Methanol is damaging. But anyway, one of the big challenges in chemistry is taking a mixture and separating it. So do you know, um, yeah? I was just going to ask about the methanol. Uh -huh. Is that not available for commercial like, buying? Do you have to make it? No, no, you can buy it. Yeah, you can you buy this at uh, most supermarkets, and you can buy it at, um, you know, anywhere. Uh, do you know those pans they have like this, the catering plans? And then they have a little heater in a, in a can. The, the alcohol in that can is methanol. Don't drink it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, you, you look at the can, oh, methyl alcohol, oh, I'm going to get this. It's this is probably more expensive than just buying regular alcohol, but probably tastes less good too. But maybe in Utah, you know, in some states they're very restrictive about uh, purchasing alcohol. So um, you can only buy alcohol on, on certain times and on certain days. There you might have more, but this this happens more in other, you know, because wood fermenting wood is a heck of a lot cheaper than fermenting sugar. Sugar is expensive, grains expensive, so this is. This happened, uh, the last case I read, it happened in South America, actually. Just a second. Yeah. In Prague, 2012. Well, this is kind of a historical. Let's see. This is not so long ago, 2012. There's, there's ones that are much more recent. The term blind drunk. 160 people in Prague. Estonia, 111 people. It, it's a problem, you know. Problem. So if you're traveling, don't accept any <laughs> drinks unless you know, you know, unless you know what the source is. I would think, yeah. And in South America, the one I read was in South America. It was like 22 people died, something like that. You can find these. This is from the Smithsonian here, but you can find these if you search around, but they, they never report these in the regular news, and you would think deaths like that shouldn't occur nowadays, and they shouldn't. You know, that type of stuff still happens. But anyway, the challenge here is uh, we want to separate it from the other stuff, so when we've got a mixture, we'd like to get a pure substance. And uh, sometimes, you know, this mixture is kind of complicated because we've got yeast, and we've got a whole bunch of other stuff in here, right? And so usually we just look for one substance. Um, this this boils down to like air. You know, where do they get oxygen? You know, there there's some people who have reduced lung capacity. They need you know higher concentrations of oxygen. Twenty percent oxygen is not enough. You know, not enough because their lungs aren't functioning at a hundred. And so there are people who need much higher percentages of oxygen, like sixty percent oxygen, seventy percent oxygen, or even pure oxygen. I, I was I, where did I see it? I I saw a can of like pure oxygen to give your give you a boost. Have you seen that? Yeah. It's sign, uh, like in China, the air pollution is so bad there that they're, they're selling it, I think, in certain parts and other, other areas. But I saw that. When I was at UCSB, you know, how do you get the pure? Well, you, making it is expensive. What you should do is you should just take mixture, air, and then separate the nitrogen from the oxygen. If you could separate the nitrogen from the oxygen, then you can get nitrogen and oxygen. Right? And so how, how do you separate it? Well, there's one company that I used to buy oxygen from, and 
other gases from called liquid air. Do you know what the liquid air did? Liquid air would take the air and then cool it down until it got so cold it liquefied, turned into liquid air. Then so once they got liquid air, then they would warm it up slowly. And the first gas to come off, if it's just nitrogen and oxygen, nitrogen has um, a little higher boiling point than oxygen. And so the first gas that will come off is, oh, is it the other way around? A little higher. Um, um, I'm sorry, oxygen. Oxygen would, would boil off first and then leaving you the nitrogen so you can capture the oxygen. It's very expensive though, very expensive. So people were looking for other ways of separating it. What are other ways of separating out mixtures rather than distillation? Distillation is expensive because you've got to heat things up. In the case of liquid air, you've got to cool it down and then heat it up. But distillation is, you know, have you ever seen a distillation apparatus? Well, there's one in this PowerPoint, but um, you've probably seen this one, distillation columns. You seen columns like this? Yeah. <clears throat> this is for crude oil. Crude oil is a mixture of a whole bunch of different substances. And so if you take crude oil, then you can um, put it in these things. These are distillation columns. And so the more, you know, what we call volatile, the ones with a lower boiling point, the ones that are easy to boil, go up to the top. And then you can capture those. The ones that are harder to boil stay down at the bottom, and you can capture those. That way you can separate things depending on the distance they can they they rise. That kind of thing. This whole thing about this is called fractionation. Excuse me. And um, when I was talking about air, I was talking about the average. That that's the average composition near sea level. What happens is the air tends to fractionate as you go to higher elevation. At higher elevation, did you know what happens? Are you going to have more nitrogen or more oxygen at higher elevation? Less oxygen, more nitrogen at higher elevations. You know? The reason is is because oxygen is a little heavier than nitrogen, so it doesn't climb as high. You know? That's fractionation. Not only that, you know, they can tell the difference between ozone that's in the ozone layer and ozone that's formed down here due to pollution. The reason they can tell it is because the makeup is a little different. It's something called, I, I talked about, you know, um, did I talk about different weights of water molecules? Well, there are three, oxi three different weights of oxygen atoms. One oxygen atom weighs 16 units, another 17, and another 18. They can tell <coughs> easily if the ozone comes from up there or down here based on the f proportions. There's a whole lot more of the lighter oxygens up there and down here there's a larger proportion of the heavier oxygens on average. And so th this, this is all separation. So here we're talking about molecules. And so the small molecules will make it all the way to the top. The heavier molecules like tar, tar is a big heavy molecule, are going to sit at the bottom. You can see that here in the distillation apparatus. That's for distilling, distilling crude. When I was distilling my ethanol, um, I used something that looked like this. I didn't use a Bunsen burner because I didn't want things to, to catch on fire. So I just used electric heater here. I put it in my um, fermentation mixture here and then just started gently heating it. As I gently heated it, the ethanol, the ethanol is pretty volatile. The ethanol volatilized off. And then you have the gaseous ethanol here. It hits this. This is a double, double wall construction. This tube has a, a jacket around it which you flow cold water in through there. Usually if you have a source here, you put ice water in there, just flow ice water continuously in there. And then once that ethanol hits that, it turns back into liquid and drips over here. And I got my 95% ethanol, 193. 
And I took a little sample of that and then tried it. But it wasn't. And so what, we, what we're interested in is purification. You know, um, sometimes it's obviously not pure. It's a mixture. Sometimes it, it's not so obvious. If it's not so obvious, then we try some certain um, purification techniques, of which distillation is one. Can you think of another dis um, purification technique? Another purification technique. Magnets. Another purification technique. Let's say uh, this is a common mixture, maybe sulfur with iron filings in it. Is that something that all that common? No. But here, uh, sulfur is sulfur magnetic. No, but the iron filings are. So after a long time, you might be able to separate the sulfur from the iron. So that's it. I've never done it myself. And I hope not to have to do it because it seems very work intensive. So hopefully we can end up with pure iron and pure sulfur after that. Um, distillation is very common for liquid mixtures. For example, distilled water is uh, purified water by distillation. What happens is in, dis in um, water we have like dissolved minerals and uh, gases in there and by heating it up you know you drive off the gases that are dissolved in water and the minerals they you know, typically uh, have very high uh, melting and boiling points so those really stay down there and end up with the deposits in there. But this is the one I was looking for. Filtration. And so what's better? Filtered water or distilled water? Drinking. Filtered? Well, actually, what's more pure? Well, not for distilled. Distilled. distilled water is more pure than filtered. Filter, you have um, little pores and depends. You know, some things can get through those. So filtration is, is not going to result. I mean, if you had sand and water mix, then it, filtration works good. If you have coffee grinds and water, then filtration works pretty good. So filtration, you can buy different levels of filter paper. They sell all kinds. Not only that, they sell um, these what we call fruited glass discs or ceramic discs um, that have um, pore size regulated in there. In fact, some of these filters, they make with molecular size pores. And these molecular sized pores, um, a filter like that acts as well, a sieve. Do you know what a sieve is? Like a flour sieve or whatever, it gets out chunks of flour. Well, if you pass air through a molecular sieve, then what can happen is um, the oxygen can pass through but leaves the nitrogen behind. It's not perfect, but it gets it, let's say it's 80% um, nitrogen over here, 20% oxygen. And then you push this through a little filter, molecular sieve, and you get a much higher percentage of oxygen here. And so it used to be, and this is, this is work that was done at UCSB, and I wish I thought of this idea because it, it's a, this is an idea. People were working on molecular sieves there because um, distillation is so expensive. But anyway, um, they ended up, and these molecular sieves have been around. They have a molecular sieve that if you pass air through, it, the air comes out enriched in oxygen because most of the nitrogen is blocked. Not 100% oxygen, but enriched. And so you have these people who have reduced lung capacity. They used to have to wheel around a oxygen cylinder, right, uh, compressed oxygen. But now they, they have a little pump, a little air pump and a molecular sieve, and it just pumps the air through. And so they just create it on demand you know, and rip the oxygen. And so that's a company that's uh, in Goleta, is that company, which is next to Santa Barbara, which is next to UCSB. Um, I forgot the name of the company, but let's see. They 
probably don't use these words. I guess the, this is a company that manufactures. This is a molecular sieve here. This is, um, what is this for? This is uh, oxygen for medical use. And so you can see the purity there. Um, what is the company? This might be the company here. Maybe they didn't patent it. All right, so these are wearable systems and uh, leads to much greater mobility. So, this is mixture versus pure. And thinking in terms of that. In the normal filtration, we have something like this. You know, we have a heterogeneous mixture, and then we filter. So here you could have a solid and liquid, and you filter out the solid. Now we have lots of different paper available. Um, the only drawback is, is the better the paper, the slower it is. And um, it could take forever to filter things. And so oftentimes we'll, we'll put a vacuum here. Now, if we put a vacuum here, seal this, and put a vacuum, it's like I'm sucking it through. Then it goes a little faster. We're going to do that. We can do vacuum. It's called vacuum filtration, and it works much faster than regular filtration. All right. Now, separating out mixtures is, is very important because, we, you know, one, we want to know the composition of the mixture. You know, how much nitrogen, how much oxygen, this kind of stuff. Two, we, we often want to deal with pure substances. So pure water, for example. When we're dealing with pure substances or pure matter, then it turns out we're only dealing with one of two things. We're either dealing with an element or a compound. You know what a compound is? Yes. Compound is two or more elements. Um, water would be a compound. Water would be an example of a molecular compound. But sand, sand is also a compound. Sand, like beach sand, consists of silicon and oxygen. It's SiO2, aka quartz. Is quartz a molecular compound? No. 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 So quartz, we just call it a compound, and the structure is quite quite a bit different. So compounds can be molecular, or they can be what we call <coughs> um, salt. Uh, salt. There's some salts that are. Uh, so this would be a compound. And so this would be three examples of compounds. CO2 would be a molecular compound, like water. Sodium chloride, this is what we call an ionic compound, or an ionic lattice compound. SiO2, this is what we call a covalent compound or, um, or covalent lattice. And the structure is quite a bit different. And so this is why this is based on structure. And so if we're looking at quartz, we, we think of quartz crystals and that kind of stuff. If we think of NaCl, we think of table salt. If we think of CO2, we just think of um, CO2 gas, CO2 carbon dioxide gas. All right, I'm going to stop here since I said I was going to end early today. And uh, we're, we're just about done with chapter two. I guess I got a little slower. Um, it went a little bit slower because of review. A review is very important.